Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. This video is going to be a continuation from our previous one, which was about investment and how to pick it, uh, the properties, things like that. So if you haven't seen that video, you better go watch it because it might get a little bit confusing trying to follow along with some of the things that we're about to talk about. The next step in the process is called the burnout process. This is the part where the investment after it's been mixed perfectly, because obviously you're all following the instructions perfectly. Um, the, this is the part where the model is burned away. So what you're doing is essentially creating a, an empty cavity for the metal to fill and thus make your product. In the lost wax process, the burnout can be fairly straightforward because of wax overall properties. It melts and turns into a liquid at a much lower temperature, so it just evacuates itself from the, uh, the mold or the flask itself. Whereas with lost resin, it's a little bit harder because it's going from a solid to a gas without any fluid in between. So it's a little bit more difficult. And there are a few more things that you need to consider. Let's run through those things right now. So to make this video a little bit easier to follow, we're going to be doing a, like a hypothetical cast. So we have actually done this cast already. We know it works, um, but we're just gonna give you a few numbers to apply directly. Uh, they might not apply directly to your cast if you're not working with, uh, in this example, silicon bronze, but uh, it's something that you can base your information off of. So as per our previous video, um, you have let's assume that you have already decided on the proper investment for the job and you've mixed all of it to a T. Um, you're measuring your powder and water accurately to the gram. You're mixing it very thoroughly for the recommended amount of time. You vacuum the mix until it's risen and fallen, poured it into the flask over your models, vacuum the flask one more time to remove any possible bubble sticking to your model. You've let it sit for between three to six hours, depending on the size of your flask. The flask should not be left for longer than six hours. If you do leave it for longer, wrap it up like a, like a mouth. <laughs> <clears throat> After the flask sets, the next step is the burnout phase, which is arguably the phase that I would see, I would say is the most controversial in our experience so far. On all of uh, the Reddit threads, Facebook groups, Instagram DMs that we get, uh, it's definitely the one where people are having the most trouble. And it's certainly the one where their most trouble can occur. In our experience, we hear some of the craziest stuff. We see a lot of really weird pictures of people trying to do, uh, you know, a quick and easy or a quick and dirty burnout. And I'm sorry, there's just really not too many good ways to do it. You, you need to put it into a proper kiln. Um, no matter what anyone tells you, casting is a science. You're trying to create an ideal environment. Uh, and through that, you need to be able to follow all the different products that you're using and mixing them perfectly, making sure everything's ideal. Some of the things that we've seen are not ideal. So don't assume that you can throw, um, you know, a gypsum bonded flask like plastic cast or something into a 2000 degree kiln for four hours uh, or stick it in your gas forge if you're into blacksmithing for an hour or put it in your home oven if you've got an extra one of those. Uh, don't try to melt your metal in the same furnace that you're going to be doing your burnout in, or just try to hit it with a big torch or something. Like, there's a lot of things that go into this that need to be done correctly, and none of those are really great options. However, you may be able to get away with certain things. Um, like in the plastic cast burnout cycle, it does state at the very beginning, you can put your flask into a kiln cold, or you can preheat the kiln to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is a little bit of variability. Also in our experience, um, if the ramp cycle, so the amount of time that the temperature goes from 300 to say 1,350 degrees Fahrenheit, um, if it doesn't meet the exact curve, like it doesn't get up to 700 and then hold, if it's just kind of like a gradual step, we've had good success with that as well. So there's a little bit of variability, but don't go from 300 straight up to 1,350. There are very specific investments um, that are designed for what's called a very rapid burnout, but they're more of a, a phosphate bonded type. They're more for dental, where time is of the essence. You are working with a client, you're trying to get their product done very quickly, and there's really no other logical way of doing it other than casting. So speed is of the essence and it is a factor. 
but those investments cost much more. Again, refer to that previous video because we did talk a little bit about it. If you try to do a rapid burnout with a gypsum bonded investment, you are bound to do something called thermal shock, which can cause uh, cracking in your investment and thus your casting will have like fins or flashing or something like that. Something is bound to happen that's not quite right. So follow the manufacturer guidelines as best as you possibly can. Again, they are guidelines, but they should be followed. Never increase the maximum temperature of your kiln arbitrarily. Don't just think like, oh, we're gonna get up to 1500 Fahrenheit, it's no problem. If you do go above the maximum rated temperature, you will start to see, as I mentioned before, those fins and cracking in your casts. Make sure your equipment is working properly. Make sure your kiln is actually reading the temperature inside properly. That's one of the number one things that we've seen is that the kiln temperature was not reading right. It wasn't getting hot enough or maybe it was getting way too hot. Uh, one of those two things, it just wasn't correct. So the recommended kiln ramp cycle for r and plastic cast, which we'll use for this example, is as follows. There's the first stage, the water removal stage. Either the kiln is at room temperature or preheated to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and you hold this for three, one to three hours, depending on your flask size. The larger the flask, the more time it needs. The smaller the flask, the less time. The next step is called the thermal transition stage. This is where you're going from 300 Fahrenheit, raising to 700 Fahrenheit over one to two hours, again, depending on your flask size. Then you hold 700 for one to two hours. The third step is the pattern removal stage where you raise from 700 Fahrenheit up to 1,350 Fahrenheit over two to three hours. Then you hold 1,350 Fahrenheit for one or for two to three hours. This is the part where the material inside your flask is actually burning away. If it's wax, it's gonna happen at a much lower temperature. If it's resin, a much higher temperature. At this point, if you're not getting good results with lost resin, don't increase the temperature, increase the duration that you're holding that maximum temperature. So if you are not getting good results with two hours, increase it to three. If you're not getting good results at three, try four. And if at four, you're still not getting good results, there might be something else wrong with the process. And then the last step, stage four, is the ramp down. In many cases, you don't wanna be casting your metal into the flask at such a high temperature. The general rule is 1000 degrees Fahrenheit below the melting temperature of the metal you're casting. For example, with this project, we used silicon bronze. Bronze, as a general rule, uh, doesn't apply to every single kind, is that you pour bronze at around 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you use that logic, you lower it by 1000, it's about 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. Could be about 1100, but it depends. On the, on the type of model, especially that you're casting. You may want to adjust this temperature by plus or minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but not by any more. If you're casting a very thin model, something like this, which is more of a standard jewelry store type ring, um, or, or even something thinner, you may want to increase that temperature. So let's say 1,100 Fahrenheit. What this does is it allows the metal to stay fluid just that instant longer and be able to get into all those details. If you're casting something heavier like this, you may actually wanna lower that temperature. So you might wanna to go to 900 Fahrenheit because when you pour such a large mass of metal into a space, it stays fluid for a considerable amount of time. It doesn't need as much help you know, to get into details and there's a, a shrinkage factor that happens that needs to be considered as well. There are a few concessions though. Um, the thousand degree below melting temperature rule does not apply to certain metals, namely platinum and palladium white gold or just straight up palladium. Um, those metals are at such a high melting temperature that the flask, even at its maximum, say 1,350, Fahrenheit is still too cool for the metal to have any time to get to its place where it should be uh, without it cooling too quickly. So if you're dealing with white golds like that, 
make sure you're doing your research in advance because white gold is not all palladium. Sometimes it's mixed with nickel or silver and other alloys. Uh, this also applies to stainless steel and titanium. However, if you're casting that stuff, you have a special casting machine anyway. So I'm gonna kind of just step away from that one. So after you have poured the metal, you do need to allow it to cool. What I like to do is I'll pour the metal. If, like bronze in this instance, it actually stays fluid for a little bit longer. Um, if you like, you know, shake the table or something, you might see it kind of rolling around on top of the flask while it's under vacuum. Um, let it solidify until the button, you know, starts, just stays hard. Then let the vacuum off, take the flask out and allow it to cool for about 10 minutes or until the button goes black at which point you may want to quench your flask into water. Generally speaking, when you quench a hot flask, the investment will get blasted off of the casting because it's still hot inside, right? So the water boils, it steams, it's blowing it away. There will still be a little bit of residue, but for the most part, it won't, you know, it won't be a brick that you're gonna be dealing with. If you let it cool all the way, it will be a brick and you're gonna have to figure out how to get into that. Either manual force with a hammer or you can use a pressure washer, whatever works for you. Uh, we actually did build our own pressure washing station for indoors. Um, check out that video somewhere up here. Uh, it's actually worked out really well for us. I strongly recommend it if that's something you think you need. So let's just do a couple little details about our setup. Uh, so this is our ancient kiln. You don't need to have the latest and greatest stuff to do you know, successful casting. Um, but it does need to be reliable, which I must say of older equipment, reliable is was always the name of the game. So as you can see, our door is broken, uh, which is not ideal, but it works great. Um, our kiln definitely needs to be re-bricked, which is why I actually have some bricks just dry stacked on top. Uh, these hold in a little bit more heat and you know it doesn't need to be too fancy. These bars here on the bottom are just mild steel. You can see they're oxidizing away slowly. Um, what these do is these just ensure that the flask has a little bit of an air gap. You need to make sure that the, whether it's wax or resin, that there's a little bit of airflow. The airflow ensures that you get a good burn. If you don't have a burn, you don't have a good burn out. All of that uh, burning stuff will fall on the floor of your, your kiln and it will start to break down. As you can see, mine's getting pretty grungy and gross. Um, so we do need to sweep that out at some point but it's not too bad. Most of it will actually burn away and go up into the more important part of the casting process, which is the ventilation. Uh, we've reviewed this product already. Um, take a look at that video because we did go into some depth with it. Uh, but this is a Quattro Air ductless fume hood. Now I know RB also makes one. It's actually a little bit cheaper. However, uh, when it comes to um, air quality, Quattro is definitely the name of the game. Like they are HEPA everything. They are medical grade. It's really good stuff. The point is when you're doing a burnout cycle, it's good to have ventilation because there's quite a bit of smoke that comes up through here and it needs to be treated properly. Um, if you're in an urban environment such as us um, here downtown Peterborough, uh, you don't want to be just kicking fumes off into the night uh, or where, whenever you're doing your burnout because you will undoubtedly get complaints. So uh, this was our solution. If you're just doing this at home, definitely consider your neighbors. Someone might be like, there's a fire, ah, and freak out. So just bear that in mind. I also like to keep everything very compact. As you can see, uh, this is our casting machine. Here is the melter. Everything is all in one space because I don't wanna have to run across the room and grab my melter and have to, you know, it's just, everything should be together so that you can do a nice swift process. Flask comes out hot, dump into the casting machine, bam, it's on, metal is poured. Whole process takes 20, 30 seconds, tops. So as we mentioned before, unless you have a very specific investment designed for a rapid burnout, the overall process should be taking you eight to 12 hours. There is no way you can get around it otherwise. If you're doing a small flask, something like this, eight hours should be very sufficient because you can only fit maybe two things in this flask. If you're dealing with more production size stuff, this is a four inch by six inch flask. This is gonna take as long as you can possibly get. The bigger you go, the longer your burnout needs to be. 
We've just been using Plasticast as our uh, example. However, if you're using something different, make sure you look at the manufacturer recommended schedule and adjust accordingly. Again, like I said before, with lost wax, you can use those guidelines pretty much as they are. But if you're doing lost resin, you will have to adjust them most likely. Adjust your hold time, not your maximum temperature. If you have any questions or concerns about the process and everything that we really just talked about, feel free to reach out to us in the comments below, uh, email, Instagram, DMs, whatever suits you, and we will be happy to help. Also consider uh, supporting this channel because every little bit helps. We are more than happy to bring you into our Discord and we can chat as a group. Um, we address tons of different issues that you may be having from not just the casting phase, but the finishing or modeling, anything really. Oh yeah, by the way, new merch. Um, this is our first little sample t-shirt. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of more t-shirts because they're fun. We like doing it. Uh, stay tuned for that because we'll be doing them very frequently. This is our first one. These are just some jewelry tools, but we also have some 3D printers and resin modeled ones coming up. Uh, we're going to be playing a lot with color. They won't just be black and white and stuff. Uh, just look out for that because it'll be kind of fun. So that's it for this video. Good luck with your castings. Again, if you have any questions, look below. Check out our merch. I will see you guys in the next video.